Jay, hey, thanks for um, thanks for joining me today. See, I remembered to call you Jay and not Coach. I mean, much. yeah, yeah, I got the memory of an elephant. Um, so, um, yeah, we just want to talk today a little bit about uh, tw what's coming upcoming. So, when when do your players report? The guys come in on August seventeenth. We have uh, physicals on the eighteenth for the incoming guys. And we get going the afternoon of the 18th. All right. So I'm 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 hoping to be there. I'm just not sure if I'm academically eligible, but you know we'll we'll talk about that on the uh, I, I uh, on the hopes that I can. I can work magic with admissions, no problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Question is, can you work magic with my soccer? I'm not quite sure anymore. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, so so tell me, what's what's that first day of training look like for you? Do you guys do anything special? Is it fitness tests or? I don't um, I don't believe in tests. Uh, but the first day, <clears throat> we set uh, the team sets our team values for the year, and then our team goals for the year. That's the very first thing we do in every preseason. And uh, it's part of, uh, of what we do. It's part of the culture. It's part of, of get, uh, getting, getting the guys off on the right foot. Um, I'm a firm believer in working the mental side as much, if not more, than the physical, technical, and tactical, and so on and so forth. So that's what, what we do. And I want to emphasize that the guys do this. I'm not even in the room. I mean, I introduce what we're going to do. We have a process in place, and then the coaches get out of there. And it's all done by the seniors, the leaders, the captains. And it gives them an opportunity to lead and to be captains. And, again, to set the tone for, for the season. Mm -hmm. So I, I gather this is so many years being done that it's almost like automatic. The, the seniors by this point know, know the process and know what they have to get out of it. Correct. And, and it's, you know, the freshmen are totally clueless like most freshmen are. And so they, they don't really, <laughs> they don't really know why we're doing this. They don't even know what we're doing. And as a result, some don't take it seriously, but as we go through the season and we continually talk to the team about our values and our goals, their values and their goals, the freshmen mm -hmm. start to understand what we're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. That's how you bring them along, right? Correct. Like get them from, from that, you know, not knowing to suddenly they're the ones leading the conversations before you know it, right? Correct. Um, hey, something I've been meaning to ask you, especially after our first conversation, um, do you, how much ch change of the way you play do you do from season to season based on, is it, or do you not? It's like the personnel that you bring on, they learn to play the way you want to play. And that's, that's that. No, it isn't that. I think if there's one thing that I've done well in my 46 years coaching, it's that I have been able to change. And uh, unlike Division One, I, I tell my Division One buddies this all the time, they have an advantage because they can have a set way to play and they can go out with their scholarships and they can find players who fit into what they want to do. That's not always the case in Division Three. We don't, you know, we can't be at times that specific. So yes, we evaluate what we have and we will change the way we play according to our the, our current current players. Now, with that said, I do have a sheet that the players get the first day of every preseason that says what is good soccer, and on the left hand column is a list of my definition of good soccer. On the right hand column is a list of what I believe is not good soccer. So we use that as kind of a guide. I mean, we we don't we've never been a very very direct team. Uh, we do. I think possession, the term possession is overrated and people don't really know what it is, but we want to keep the ball on the ground. We want to play uh, two touch. I don't want to play one touch. 68% of one touch passes are turnovers. And so there are some guidelines or standards, but the formations and uh, how we play those formations change all the time. They might even change in the, in the middle of a season. 
All right, so I have to ask, where did you get that stat, the 68% of one touch? Oh, I don't remember. That's very interesting yeah, to me, by the way. I, I, I don't remember where I got it, but I, 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 yeah. I read a ton, and I picked, yeah. I picked it up somewhere. And, um, and I think it's true. If you were to watch a, a normal soccer game and just take a moment and make a little mark for every time a one-touch ball is turned over, you'll see that it's, it's – yeah. especially – Steve, at our level, you know, we're a good Division Three team, but we're still a Division Three team. And even at the Division One level in this country, uh, our players aren't really great at one-touch play. And yeah. so why do it? We we discourage it all the time. And, you know, the French national team, when they bring, bring their team together, they don't allow one-touch play in the preparation for a tournament or a game, whatever they're going to do. They want their players to play two touch in fact their expression is i can't say it in french but in english it's one for you one for me one touch for you one touch for me that and so that's they they say that repeatedly over and over and over to get the two touch play organized mm -hmm. um that's interesting because i actually have this conversation with my youngest son who plays as a CDM. He's 13. So um, take that for what it's worth. And he likes one touch there in that role. And, and I always tell him, I'm like, one touch does not work unless you are very, very good at it. And too many kids try to play one touch and they are not very, very good at it. And as a result, it becomes more dangerous than it is a benefit. I think if you get at the professional level, I watched Barcelona last night. Even those guys know two touches more effective than the one touch, right? Because yeah. they're always taking, even if it's an easy ball, settle the ball, and then make the pass. Yeah. But I could go down a rabbit's the hole. The problem on with our players happens before the one touch. And that is our yeah. kids don't look at the field all the time. Like a Messi mm -hmm. if you watch Messi play, or any, <clears throat> excuse me, top level international player, their head never stops moving. Oh, is yeah. I, I have yeah. A, a short video clip I show my team. Frank Lampard, when he was playing for Chelsea, this is a 11 mm -hmm. seconds, I'm sorry, a 17 second video, and he moves his head 11 times in 17 seconds. Yeah. So if you can do that, then you have a better chance and only a chance yeah. of being able to play one touch, but our kids don't do it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And that I would add that understanding sort of what is around you. And then I think pos body positioning, because I don't think this is my latest thing. I don't think clubs have the t time, I'll just say that, to teach the nitty gritty details of that on a consistent basis. And so as a result, kids don't know. Yeah. Proper one touch your position to receive the ball and give the ball, right? Like it's just automatic i don't think kids move like that and i'm not sure. that's not a rip on anybody no i get it and i'm not sure that all the club coaches even know that or, or can yeah or can teach it um so yeah it's it, that, that to me that's a problem. yeah yeah all right so i gotta ask so what i know your team is going to be working on the goals do you uh, and I'm not asking for goals but what what sort of expectations do you have for this fall well, I think we should be pretty good. Um, our last three classes, because of my assistant coaches, have been very, very good. Really good. And we have a very good mm -hmm. freshman class coming in. With that said, I don't see any of those freshmen starting for us. I do see some of them playing for us. And we, uh -huh. and we only graduated three, three seniors. So theoretically, yeah. I don't really remember what we were last year, Six, 16, three and two or 16, two and three or something. So, something like that. So, yeah. So theoretically, you know, we should, we should be quite good, but you know, we have a really, really tough and good schedule. So it's going to be every game. Oh my gosh. Challenge. We don't have, maybe we have one or two easy games. I don't want to tell you who they are, but, um, but other than that, every single game's a challenge. Yeah. Um, who, I, I, I noticed, I mean, you're the big name player, Hector Gomez has graduated or has graduated or is graduating. Yep. 
Um, do do what when you look at your upperclassmen? Do you have any? Do, do you have anyone? Uh, any of those guys that you're like they have to step up a level now um, if we're going to have a successful season? Well, Jacob Brooker was a sophomore last year. Yeah. And he also made All American. He's a good goal scorer. And yes, we've already in the spring we already talked about this with our with our guys. Now, part of the problem with our team and playing with a guy like Hector is Hector takes over a game and our guys off the ball don't really know what he's going to do or how he's going to do it. And we end up sometimes standing around and watching him play. Yeah. So now, yeah. you know, I think, yes, I think Jag is going to step up. He's a really, really good player. We have an income. I like him a lot, by the way. Yeah, he's, I'm a big, big fan. Yeah, he's, he's good. So I think he, you know, I, I don't know what he had, 10 or 12 goals last year, but he, he's worked our camps this summer, and he, you know, he's a, mm -hmm. he's a very confident, almost cocky guy, but great, great scorers, that's how they are. And That's what that's what you need. Right. <laughs> that's right. So, so yeah, he, he's got to step up, and we have a, a young man coming back from the Dominican Republic, Franklin Rodriguez. Who is playing down? He, he was he, he he was the last player cut for this uh, Dominican U twenties. Uh, he's a forward, and he my assistant coaches have watched him on some kind of TV that they have. Or whatever. <laughs> they said, and they told me the other day that he's really really improved and he's playing really really well. So so yeah, the young mm. guys are gonna. It's their turn. So it's their turn to step up and get things done, and and that's been kind of the tradition and of what we've done over the years, and, yeah. and so we're hoping that it happens again. Yeah, I, I was just surprised how few seniors you graduated. I, I don't know what I was expecting. I think I was. Ex I always expect like 10, 10 every year, right? Like give or take eight, twelve, but it's always a, but only three. When I see that, I'm like. Yeah. Oh, that coaching staff must be ecstatic, right? Because it just, your team gets older, but you're not losing as many. So That's correct. I mean, we try to bring in between eight and 10 kids a year with a goalkeeper in that group. And so we always have mm -hmm. more goalkeepers because everything we do is to goal. And uh, mm -hmm. so this, this graduating class, this past graduating class was a bit of an aberration. And I... I don't know historically what exactly happened. I, I think COVID had a lot to do with that. Um, but mm -hmm. we just had, uh, in terms of numbers, the quality of those three kids was good. But in terms of numbers, we were just down that recruiting year. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, like I said, I mean, that, that just to me, you guys are reloaded for, I mean, you guys are going to be really tough. Um, but you mentioned you mentioned your schedule. I, I I couldn't help but notice your your conference is already very very difficult, right? I mean, just putting that aside, out of conference you start with Case Western, you Loris, Hope, Calvin, Ohio Northern, John Carroll Trine, Capital. And then you open the conference with with Oberlin. And I was just wondering, do you you've never every year that I've sort of followed you or looked, and every year it's almost like you purposefully schedule some of the hardest games that a program could play. And and I'm just you know what's the thought thought process behind playing the toughest competition that you can get. Well, I like to remind people that my first 10 or 12 years at Ohio Wesleyan, the only teams that we played out of conference were Division I teams. Um, uh, Bowling Green, Akron, Ohio State, and so on and so forth. Because, and that kind of philosophy has carried over, but of course the D1s won't play us any longer in the fall because of all this strength of schedule stuff. I get, And I get it. Yeah. Um, but so we try to seek out the best possible teams that we can play because I expect us to make the NCAA tournament. We've made it 42 times and that's how you get better. You don't get better playing a team that's 500. You just, you just don't. In, in fact, in fact, it's hard to get up for teams like that, but my guys will mm -hmm. get up for that, that gauntlet that you just read off. Yeah. 
and it just makes us better. And, and you know, mm-hmm. we play against better people. It, it, it challenges us. It forces our guys, if they want to be successful, to get better every single day. So between games, I'm always pointing at the next game and saying, well, look, Loris was in the tournament last year. You know, they're ranked number whatever and so on and so forth. So there's re- no mental letdown. Every, every game we want to play mm-hmm. at our highest level. Mm-hmm. Can I can I ask a dumb question in the room? Do you ever worry or do you ever experience because of that strength that strength of schedule that towards the end of the season your guys are tired or physically they just can't do it because they've been competing at that high level? Uh, no, I don't worry about that be- because we've become very very good at recovery. And uh, you know, mm-hmm. twenty years ago, fifteen years ago, we we didn't know anything about about recovery and periodization and all those things. And now, you know, so, I mean, no, we are really careful. Our guys wear the heart monitors. We have a mm-hmm. computer. We can tell guys who are getting physically tired because of the c- computer stuff. So we might give a guy a day off or a couple of guys mm-hmm. a day off. It doesn't matter because in the end, one practice session doesn't really matter at all. But the recovery mm-hmm. is really, really important. So. Mm-hmm. But we're, we're, once, once the season starts, we're all about recovery. What I try to do is take, in October, take a midweek game off so that we mm-hmm. can have kind of a semi-preseason uh, again and get back to the basics on mm-hmm. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of that week in preparation mm-hmm. for Saturday. Because, because during, the year, during the year, we're recovering from last night's game, and then tomorrow we're preparing for the next game. So, you know, the teaching and coaching – it's really difficult to teach and coach once the season starts, you know, so it's all, about, mm-hmm. it's all about management once the season starts. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So what of those games or of your entire schedule, which, which games do you have circled with a red Sharpie? <laughs> People don't believe. I get that asked that all the time, but there are, we don't circle any with a with a red sharpie. We don't think we have rivals. A lot of the play teams that we play in our conference think they're our rivals. Oh, they're. <laughs> uh, but we don't look at it that way. So we don't say, you know, okay, we're playing uh, Denison on whatever. There's a big circle there. We got We don't do that. We want to play at the same level against every opponent on our schedule. And so we don't make mm-hmm. a big deal about anybody. Um, we make a big deal about ourselves. If you were to listen to our pregame preparation, you know, every, every game in, the, uh, in our pregame meal, I give out a team sheet. And the team sheet on the front page, the first paragraph is about the team we're going to play. The rest of the team sheet is about us. Because mm-hmm. I think we have good enough players that if we focus on if they focus on themselves and getting better and not worrying about the other team, they will play at a high level. And that's what we, Mm -hmm. that's what we want. We want them to play at a high level. And you know, this, you played, if you can remember that far back, but you played, uh, (laughs) you know, if I tell my team, okay, look, number 17 is a really good midfielder, but he's all left footed. They don't remember that when they walk on the, they don't remember. No, so we're just not at all. We're complicating things for them. So we want to make things, as simple as possible. You know, one of the theories of motivation is all about confidence. And the more confident your players are, uh, the the better they're going to play. I mean, that's a no brainer. Everybody everybody knows that. So we work all week on improving the confidence levels or at least maintaining it of the players. Our Mm pregame warm up is 23 minutes long. We don't do anything that the guys are going to screw up. We don't do you know, 5v5 and all those other things. We don't, because we want them to walk. We want a good positive warm-up, walk on the field, be positive, be confident, and let's go. Do you, do you, are you, uh, that's a, I, I, how, have you been doing that for quite a while? Yes. The no warm-ups? Yes. Or the, the, and, and is it with the ball at all, or do you? It's with the ball, but we do things that are so simple that you can't screw it up. And I, I <laughs> found over the years, I mean, 5v5, and a lot of teams still do that. 5v5 is a very yeah. difficult activity. So you're, you're kicking your teammates. Yeah. The ball's going out of bounds. It's not a positive activity. Why do it? 
before. Yeah. You know, you, you, you've got to work to make it, your, your players feel competent. And if they feel competent in what they do, they will feel confident. And if they are confident, mm-hmm. they will play at a high level. So why do you yeah. yell and scream at them? Why do you do warm-ups of 45 minutes? That's another half, right? I mean, so now, now in the, at the end of the second half, you guys are beat. So we just don't, we just don't do it. So. I, I've, that's, that is very interesting because I coach, um, I'm a volunteer assistant at a high school, and I've had this going debate with, why do we have these guys start an hour before? Even just getting on the field, having their boots on to knock the ball around an hour before a game. Like, it's incomprehensible to me because... And then it's funny because we do the keep-away sessions. The fi- It's not 5v5, you know, right. 5v5, 5v2, or whatever. But it's it's substantial. Right. And... And then they go to shooting, and we've had guys. I've had, we've had guys come come off uh, the shooting drill and just be like, "I can't get it on frame. Right. I can't. It's just going all over the place." Right. And I've always, in the back of my mind, I never that. That's interesting because you're you're right. If you walk out on the field confident, it doesn't matter what the other team throws at you. Right. You are confident enough to adjust. Correct. And you know, without being told. No. Right. Exactly. And speaking of shooting drills, we never allow our starting goalkeeper to be in shooting drills. Because it's usually not a very good situation for the keepers, is it? I mean, they're getting no. they're getting bombarded repeatedly. Yeah. A lot of the balls go in the net. And why, again, have our keeper walking on the field with questioning his ability as the game is getting... It just, does, it just doesn't make sense to me. So our, our backup yeah. keepers do the shooting drill while we're warming up our starter over on the side over there, just getting mm-hmm. catches, getting the field... Yep. So on and so forth. The basics. I've always said, like, the most important, and goalkeepers is a separate topic, but, right? Like, for me, the biggest, important, the most important piece of a goalkeeper's warm up are the basics. Correct. Catching the ball, you know, touching the ball with your feet, those things. Th- those, to me, if you do that and you do that well, and, and but I never equated it with confidence. Right. You know, I was just like, oh, he's ready, right? Like, um, that's re- re- really, really interesting. Um. All right, last question for you, and let you get on with your day and your preparations. Forget the soccer. What would you say your team's greatest challenge is going into the season? And and you know, mentality. You, you talk about confidence. You know, or is there exuberance? Like, what are what is what are those things in the back of your mind? Or like this one could really. This may they this we, we have to be very aware of this because it could hurt us. There's one big one, um, and it is the uh, um, it's the history of the program, and these mm-hmm. guys feel oftentimes this innate yeah. pressure to when you walk into our locker room. We have one one whole wall is our team pictures of of teams who won championships conference championships, regional championships, national championships, and the whole wall is filled. And so Mm -hmm. there's that pressure with these guys. Can we get on the wall? Are we good enough to be, to continue this tradition of Ohio Wesleyan soccer? I never talk about it ever um, because it's there. It's always there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have every single game, we have alums come and I always invite them into the locker room. They listen to what I have to say. They talk to the players Sometimes I think that's counterproductive because I think, again, that's adding to this pressure of because mm-hmm. this pressure of carrying on the tradition. Are we going yeah. to get on the wall? And yeah. and what that means is um, the, the teams we play, I mean, we have a winning record against every team we play. Um, that's how it is. So. These guys, these teams want to beat us. I mean, they, 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 mm-hmm. they're, they're motivated a little bit more than, a, 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 I say, a normal game. Normal in, in quotes, of course. So I think that's the biggest thing that we have to deal with every, every single year. And it's very, very subtle. You know, you're, we're talking about changing our locker room because there are so, there are so many championship plaques, and then this wall is all American, and then this wall is African. <laughs> and you know the wall. In fact, we have no, 
room left. I've got a pile of, of things in my office and no place to put them. Um, <laughs> plus, it's, it's a, it's, that, that pressure is real. It, it's real. They, they come yeah. here because of that, but sometimes it can, be, it can get really heavy. Yeah. I don't, I don't doubt that at all. Right. I mean, you, you've heard, uh, right. Like even, you know, national team, the weight of the Jersey, right? Like there is a weight to it and whether, and especially super successful programs like yours. Yeah. You put on that Jersey. There's a, there's a lot of guys who went, who were in it before you and you better like psychologically, I would always be thinking, like, I better pull my weight, yeah. you know, like I better do what I have to do to you know, almost like honor that, that, that past and that tradition. That is really, yeah. that, like you said, it's a double-edged sword, right? It's really great from a recruiting standpoint and got guys who come in, but if you're around it long enough, it gets to be, it gets to be, it gets to be heavy, right? You know, so. we lose one game and the guys like, they, I mean, and I keep telling them, one game doesn't matter, guys. It just doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, we just, now if we lose 10 in a row, which thankfully we never have, I, okay, yeah. that's a problem. But we never do that. And we, I know this is a cliche, but it's true. We get everybody's best game, period. You know, so I don't, mm -hmm. even, I don't even go scouting teams anymore because I go, I go and watch Denison play. And then we don't get the same Denison team that I watched mm -hmm against Worcester last Saturday or whatever, or what yeah. it is, we get a Denison team that plays at a higher level. So we, yeah. we, we don't even look, we don't even go look at teams anymore. We just focus on ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's true. That's that, 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 that is interesting, right? Like, and, and in your case, right? Like as long as you deliver and you show up and play the way you're expecting to, and the guys come out confident and play, yeah, you are going to get the best effort out of them. And then the chips will fall where they may, right? I mean, that's the game. That's why we play it. But well, you position yourself in a much better spot than if you if you don't, right? So I think one of the tenets of our program, one of the foundation values is fun. Um, we yeah. make it fun. We make it fun in practice. Everything we do is fun. Because I tell these guys, they don't remember this, but they went back to their second soccer practice because they had fun mm -hmm. at the first. And they keep going yeah. back because for some reason, and it's different some for every guy, guy, for some reason, for them, soccer is fun. So when it ceases mm -hmm. to be fun, then it becomes work and you don't play yeah. <laughs> at the highest level when you work. You just, no. you just don't. No. So we you don't. we work extremely hard. I'm very anal about practice. I mean, we just mm -hmm. don't go out and throw the ball out. We work very hard to make sure that practices are successful, so the mm -hmm. kids feel competent, and the practices yep. are fun. And we and we yeah. and we do that by everything we do in practice. We compete and we keep score. So at the mm -hmm. end of the day, you know, the red team beat beat the green team or whatever colors. It doesn't matter. Yep. So they get their pictures taken, and my assistants put that on social media and so on and so forth. Yeah. The losing team has to pick up the gear. They have to do the laundry, or they have to clean the floor, or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. And then we do it again tomorrow. And and we want our guys looking forward to coming to practice all day long. Practice, yeah. And when they yeah, leave, yeah. we want to smile on their on their face because they had fun. Yeah. Yeah. So, whatever. <laughs> Such simple rules to live by, right? <laughs> but we we overcomplicate it. That's well, for sure. Coaches overcomplicate things. Yes, one hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Right. Very well, Coach uh, Jay. Sorry. Okay. Really do appreciate you 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 taking the time. This was wonderful. I I really do. I'm seriously. I I could do this weekly. I'm not threatening you, but I could do because I I I do learn. I do learn quite a bit when, when we talk. Um, so really do th am thankful and uh, wish you and your men all the best. We'll do the best we can, believe me.